Good evening, everyone. My name is Yuri Rashkin, and I am president of the Janesville Toastmasters. I'd like to welcome all of you here tonight to the Hedberg Public Library. This is a Nancy Parker series, and uh, Janesville Toastmasters are working with the Hedberg Public Library to bring you some great speakers in the community. And uh, it's a great learning experience for all of us in the club, and we hope that uh, members of the community will benefit and enjoy from this as well. Janesville Toastmasters is a club that's dedicated to helping everyone improve their public speaking skills to become more effective speakers and leaders. We meet every first and third Tuesday at the library downstairs at 7 o'clock. It's a great club, and if you're interested in becoming a better public speaker, we invite you to come in and check it out. It's a lot of fun. Now, tonight is a treat. We have a great, great speaker. Our speaker tonight comes to us from the Janesville Toastmasters Club, Ooh, okay. <laughs> where he has honed his speaking skills as a member for the past 16 years. The interesting thing is we have members who have been in the club longer than 16 years. That tells you anything. A husband, father, and grandfather, he is also an accomplished competition speaker, having advanced to the finals of Toastmasters International World Championship of Public Speaking not once, but twice. He has traveled throughout the United States, giving seminars on weight loss and smoking cessation utilizing hypnosis, as well as corporate training seminars on improving sales performance through the subconscious mind and developing public speaking skills. I can't wait. Please help me welcome Rick Bronton. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Very good. You guys already passed the first test. Now, recent studies have shown that every third person is remarkably intelligent and unbelievably attractive. Now, with that in mind, I'd like everybody to please turn to the person immediately to your right and take a look at them. <laughs> Don't be shy. Take a good look at them. Okay. Now take a turn to your left. Take a good look at the person seated immediately to your left. <laughs> well, obviously, it's not either one of those two, so it must be you, right? <laughs> and yes, I do mean you. And I speak to a lot of groups of all different sizes. I've spoke to groups as, as small as four or five people, and I've spoke in front of groups of 2,000 at the world finals of the international competition. But I always bring a message that is geared to an individual-specific message. Now. One thing I would like to do before we get too far underway here is thank the Janesville Hedberg Library, also the Nancy Parker Foundation for putting these on, and the Janesville Toastmasters. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come and listen to what we have to offer. Every speaker worries about how they're going to be introduced. And I do want to thank Yuri for his warm introduction. He did a fine job. Actually, he read it exactly the way I wrote it, so it went very, very well. <laughs> We're going to go through some mechanics tonight, some of the things that go into making a quality presentation and getting a message across to the audience. Before we get into mechanics, though, there are two things that every speaker really has to know. The first thing is you have to know your message, because if you don't know your message, you're not going to be able to convince anyone of what it is that you're trying to accomplish. The second thing you have to do is you have to know a little bit about your audience because the audience is going to play a large part in how the message is delivered. So those are a couple of things you really have to know right up front. Speaking in front of groups is a lot like hypnosis. Now, are any of you nervous about having a hypnotist in front of you right now? <laughs> Good, there's no reason to be nervous at all. Why it's like hypnosis? Hypnosis deals with the subconscious mind. And most of the times when you're speaking, unless you're giving a slideshow of your summer vacation, some type of documentary effort, you're going to have some designated purpose that you're trying to accomplish. There's going to be a call to action that you're going to want your audience to act upon. Therefore, you are going to need to move into the part of the brain that makes all decisions. And here's a news clip for you. It's not your conscious mind that makes decisions. The mind is kind of like a, an iceberg. The little bit that you see out of the water is about 10% of the iceberg. 90% of the iceberg is underwater. It's the same thing with the way the mind works. The 10% that you see, that's the conscious mind. Not very much power here. Basically, it's your senses. 
It's the way that you receive information in the real world. Now the subconscious mind makes up 90% of the mind, and this is where all the power of the mind is, because this is where all your memories are stored. And from all of your memories, all of your decisions are made based on two things. The subconscious mind makes decisions that take you either toward pleasure or away from pain. That's the only way that it works. So every decision you've ever made, a lot of people think they make conscious decisions. They do not. I always like this in courtroom scenarios. Somebody says, well, Your Honor, he made a conscious decision or she made a conscious decision, when actually it's absolutely impossible to make a conscious decision. I'll give you a very quick example. Let's say I had a fire going down here right in front of me, about 5,000 degrees. Carl, what would you say to me if I asked you to just reach into that fire with your bare hands and just pull out a couple of hot coals from the bottom of that fire and set it off on the floor beside the fire? What would you tell me? No. Thank you for being so polite. Because when I've asked that question before, I get all kinds of answers. Now, you might think Carl just made a conscious decision, but he did not. The only part of the conscious mind that was involved was he heard the question being posed to him through the sense of hearing. After that, immediately, the conscious mind has a little bit of a conference with the boss, the subconscious mind. And somewhere in your memories, somewhere in your history, you've dealt with fire once or twice before, and you've been burned once or twice. So immediately, the answer and response goes up, tell him, no, that's going to hurt. But it happens so fast that you think you made a conscious decision when you really didn't. You made a decision subconsciously, just like every decision that you've ever made. And in public speaking, what we need to do is we need to break through the filters of the conscious mind and get into the parts of the subconscious mind that are capable of making decisions if we want somebody to make and respond to the call to action that we make. That's why it's vitally important to do that. And one other thing you need to know about the subconscious mind. It has 90% of the mind, it has all the power, it makes all the decisions, and it can't tell the difference between fantasy and reality. Absolutely can't tell the difference. Sounds pretty dangerous, doesn't it? Now, how many of you have been hypnotized before? Could I see your hands? A couple of you? How many people in here don't think you could be hypnotized? Could I see your hands? Well, I've got news for you. Everyone can be hypnotized. In fact, I'm going to hypnotize everyone right now. Okay, you ready for this? No one's ready for this right away. But what I want you to do is take everything off your lap. I want you to sit with your feet flat on the floor. Sit up straight. Now, I want everybody to take their hands and clasp them together very tightly in front of them. Now, in a moment, I'm going to count to three. When I count to three, I want you to raise your fingers straight up in the air, just like this. Now, you don't need to practice. It's going to be easy to do. Wait till I count to three, okay? Now, when you raise your fingers, then I want you to stare intently at the tips of your fingers. And while you are staring at the tips of your fingers, I want you to imagine the thickest, tightest, strongest rubber band in the world being wrapped round and around and around the tips of your fingers. You ready? One, two, three, go. Tighter, tighter, stare at your fingers, tighter, tighter, tighter. It's not me, it's just you guys, tighter, tighter. Okay, just shake them loose, shake them loose. Let me ask you, did any of your fingers move? Oh yeah, I was watching you out there. A couple of you guys were out here like, I can't believe this is actually happening. A couple of you were like this. I saw one of you like this looking at everybody else. <laughs> Now, I did see a couple of people that were standing there with their fingers stretched apart and they're not going to, I don't care what this bum says, I'm not going to fall for this trick, it's not going to happen, that's okay. But what happened was you fought me. And when you speak in front of groups, there are going to be people in the audience that are going to fight you. They're going to resist what it is that you're trying to tell them, what it is the message that you're trying to bring to them, the call to action that you're trying to get them to respond to, they're going to resist that. So what we know from our work in Toastmasters, I'm going to share a little bit of the Toastmasters experience with you tonight, we are developing skills and techniques that enable us to break through that resistance so that we can get our message through to people. First thing we have to do is, we have to know the importance of that first impression. The opening is vitally important in our speech. It has to be something that grabs somebody's attention because you only have a few seconds to make a first impression. Now, I started tonight with just a little bit of a humorous approach just to get people engaged and kind of along with me on the ride. That's all I want to do is get you to come along, get you to feel important as an individual in the group. 
And there's a number of ways that you can do this. Uh, you can do this by developing mental pictures and images for the audience, kind of engaging their thought processes and their, and their imaginations a little bit. I started one of my speeches at the international, file, in the international finals like this. Picture in your mind a young child playing in a backyard the size of Wyoming. As he runs back and forth across the grass, the broom that he straddles is actually a chestnut steed of majestic strides why the slightest tug on the reins and that horse responds as if their thoughts are somehow magically connected. The stick that he waves in his right hand is actually a pearl-handled pistol of unparalleled craftsmanship. Why, mister, you could shoot every tin can from Montana to the Rio Grande with that fine shooting iron. And he'd never have to reload because it wasn't a six-shooter. It was a 56-shooter. And as he's playing out in the backyard, He's finally jolted back from his imagination by the voice of his mother as she hollers from the back porch, Johnny, come on in, it's time for dinner. But it's the last words that she speaks before she goes back in the house that has the biggest impact on him as she tells him, be sure you leave those sticks outside. And so it is that one person's reality is shaped by that of another. All I'm doing in this, as in this approach, this aspect, is I'm trying to instill in your mind some mental images that get you engaged in what we're talking about and provide you a path to follow along with the story. That's one way to do it, developing mental images. You can do it with jokes. If you do use stories, you have to be pretty careful that you have an engaging story. Because if the story takes a long time, there's a danger involved in that. That if it doesn't work, if it's a long joke and it doesn't work and it flops, at that point in time, you have invested considerable energy and effort and a good amount of time, and you're not off to a good start. So always keep it short. You can have one-liners for openings. The first year I competed in the finals, there was a gentleman there by the name of Brett Rutledge. I might add he did win that competition as well. Came out of New Zealand. One-line opening, very effective. He walked to the front of the stage and he said in his New Zealand accent, always a kid your parents wouldn't let you play with. Think of what he did with one line. He associated with every single person in that audience because everybody here tonight, you either knew that kid or you were that kid. So everybody has a focal point from which they can begin to travel along with the speaker and become engaged in the message that he's bringing. So openings are gonna be very, very important. You can pose a question for an opening and you don't have to do it drab and boring. If you're doing a, a presentation on fire safety, you don't have to come out and say, how many of you have a good plan in case of a fire emergency? Could I see your hands? Think of a different way to approach it. You can start off by saying, it's the early morning hours. You're deep in sleep and you're having a dream. And in your dream, you can hear your dog barking. And the barking continues, but it's muffled as if the dog is down in the basement. And all of a sudden, you're jostled out of your sleep, and you realize it's not a dream. You can actually hear your dog faintly barking. You look over to the clock on the nightstand, and you notice the clock's not working. The electricity is off. And then your senses are coming to, and you start to notice a distinct smell of smoke in the house. As you jostle your wife awake, a million thoughts are racing through your mind. Do I run to the bathroom to get water or wet towels? Do I go for the children? Do I go for the phone? What do I do? Do you have a plan on how to deal with a fire emergency. So you don't have to pose the question directly. Engage the audience first. Get them to think. Put them in your story. Put them in your presentation so that then they have the, the ability to travel with you and you can take them where you need to go with them in order to get that message taken care of. So opening is going to be very, very important. Now there are a couple of things that you should never do. One of them is apologize. Never, ever apologize during your speech. What would you think if I came in here tonight and said, well, please forgive me if I get a little bit offline, off track on my message because I was coming in here, I had my notes in my hand and as soon as I opened the door, the wind grabbed my notes and scattered them all over the parking lot and I really don't know where I'm going from here on out. What's your thought? You're not thinking about what I'm gonna talk to you about, you're thinking about what a moron this guy is. He couldn't even hang on to his notes coming in to give a presentation before us tonight. Or come in all hustle and bustle saying, sorry I'm late but I got caught in traffic and I got caught behind the train. And don't apologize for anything because all an apology is going to do is it's going to take your audience off your message 
onto what your problems are. And you don't come before an audience to share your problems with them. So don't apologize for, everything, for anything. Second thing you should never do is use PowerPoint. <laughs> now I'm not talking about the Microsoft program. That's good. That little thing on the screen that gives you kind of a, an outline and a guideline to go, that's good. What I'm talking about is this. You see speakers using PowerPoint and they point at their audience and all pointing does is it separates your audience from you. All of a sudden they're not with you, they're against you. And I'm going to use Bill Clinton as a classic example. Bill Clinton won an election with four words. I feel your pain. And he said it like this. Finger was bent. It did not point. It was bent. So while he said, I feel your pain, he was addressing you, he was motioning towards you, but he was not pointing at you. On the other hand, if you remember the infamous Monica Lewinsky comment, I did not have sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. And he was pointing at the audience, and he was separating himself and dissecting himself away from that audience. Do not point at an audience. Curl the finger. You can also reach your hand out in expression if you want to talk. If I want to talk to you, or I want to talk to you, or I want to talk to you. I can do the same, accomplish the same task by motioning to you. Also gives me the ability at the same time then to bring you back into me so that I can further connect all of you with me as the speaker of the night. So don't ever point at an audience. Don't apologize. Don't point. That's bad business when you're up here at the lectern. It doesn't work good. Now, there are some things that you should always do. First thing you should do is dress appropriately. Doesn't mean you have to have a suit and tie on, but I firmly believe that if you're addressing an audience of any, of any size, guys, you should have a shirt and tie on. There's an old saying, he who has the tie has the authority. And when you're speaking in front of an audience, you want to have a certain amount of authority when you speak in front of that group. Dress appropriately. Give the office of speaking to another person or another group the respect that it deserves. Women, don't just come up casually dressed. Dress in a business manner so that you have authority just by the way that you are dressed. Always make sure you're dressed appropriately. Now, if you're speaking at a company picnic, obviously there's going to be some instances where that suit and tie thing is not going to apply. You know, if you're out there at the baseball diamond at the company picnic and you have to give some awards out or something, you're going to give a little presentation, then you may want to change it. But in most occurrences, most situations, just like tonight, when we've got a formal setting, dress appropriately for that. The next thing is eye contact. The way you connect with an audience, you have to have some eye contact. Now, you'll see some, spe some speakers that will scan the ceiling. You'll see some speakers that will talk to the floor. And I've heard a thousand and one different scenarios for how you develop eye contact. I had one guy tell me that, and you probably heard this one too, imagine the audience sitting in front of you in their underwear. Now I'm going to tell you folks right now, there's a lot of things I want to see in my lifetime, <laughs> but you guys sitting in your underwear is not one of them. That would distract me. The best thing that I found in a group of any size, you don't have to speak to the entire group. Pick out four, five, six friendly faces, people that tend to smile back at you while you're addressing them, and talk to four or five people. A few seconds over here, a few seconds back here, a few seconds up here. You can talk to four or five people. Anyone can talk to four or five people. So pick out a few friendly faces that are scattered throughout the audience and just spend time talking to them. When you get to points that are particularly important in your speech that may carry a lot of weight, then you're going to want to stop and you're going to want to lock in with somebody for a few seconds and talk to them. And you're going to want to lock into another person. You want to talk to them for a few seconds. Because that act of locking in with somebody, all of a sudden everybody feels like, this guy came to talk to me as an individual. He didn't come talk to everybody else. He came for me. And that's important. And eye contact is the best way to accomplish that. Don't just scan your audience and pan and, and think everything's OK. You're going to have to have some eye contact. Don't look at their forehead. Just Find five, six friendly faces, talk to those people on it. Works really, really well. Use of humor is going to be vitally important when you're talking to an audience. Why? Because you need to develop some rapport with an audience. 
the easiest, fastest way to develop rapport with an audience is to just get them to laugh a little bit. If they can laugh with you, they figure, you know, I like this guy. I can laugh with him. He's an all right guy. I think I can deal with this guy. And there's a, there's a quick way to develop some rapport. Now, when you're in competition speaking in Toastmasters, you have five to seven minutes with a 30-second leeway before you're disqualified. In other words, you can, if you go less than four and a half minutes, they disqualify you. If you go more than seven and a half minutes, they disqualify you. And I am living proof of the fact that they're very, very serious on this time constraint thing because I was in the semifinals in 1996 up in Green Bay and I went 15 seconds over the time limit and the judges never even saw my ballot. I got disqualified. So if you've got especially a short period of time, use humor to develop that rapport of the audience. The other thing is if you've got a very serious talk, if there's a lot of heavy information in there or maybe it's an ominous tone speech, you want to utilize humor every so often in that speech because when people laugh, they breathe a little deeper. They get a little more oxygen. They get refreshed. Now, a lot of you have probably heard of Zig Ziglar before, one of the most sought after speakers on the motivational circuit today. Zig Ziglar will use humor every so many minutes for a certain amount of seconds through every talk that he gives. It is mapped out and it is choreographed out precisely because he knows if he just gets up there and barrels through that message, about halfway through it, half the audience is going to get completely fatigued and wore out. And he's going to lose them. They're going to fall asleep on them. And if you do after dinner speaking, it's especially important that you let them laugh and let them breathe a little bit. Because after you've had a heavy meal, the first thing that the brain wants to do is it wants to shut off for a little while and have a little siesta. You can't allow the brain to do that. So you've got to give the message, give them a little humor, let them break it up, keep the thing broke up in pieces and segments. Make sure that you're allowing them to breathe a little bit. Allow that oxygen to take place on it. Use your body and facial expressions. Now, if I wanted to bring a message for all of you, I can use my body to explain all of you. I can also say that I wanted to bring a message for all of you, which is more impressive in front of the audience. Obviously, the bigger movement is more inclusive. It gives a little more energy to the audience as well. And if you're speaking in front of very large groups, you're going to have to be a little more exaggerated in your expressions simply because the person in the back who's looking through on any number of heads to get to a visual sighting of you cannot see you that well. And there's also the distance thing that has to be made up. So the larger the audience, the larger the gestures have to be. If you're talking about, I had to climb over a fence to get into the yard I needed to be in. You can merely tell them I had to climb over a fence. But if you tell them I had to climb over a fence, all of a sudden there's a physical energy that's involved. It gives their eyes a little something to do besides just giving their ears and their brain something to do. So it just gives them another point of reference, gives them another level that you can take them to that in keeps them included in what it is you're talking about. So use the hand, use the faces. You see, a lot of times, how many of you watch David Letterman from time to time? If you watch that guy's face, that guy will say a million words just by the changes in his facial expressions from the dumb look to the astonished look to you name it, but he very effectively uses facial expression in order to convey a message without saying anything. Works very, very well. Now, Dennis Hopper, if you get a chance, um, the Ameriprise commercials that he does on TV where he's talking about people in their retirement, and you watch the way he uses his hands, it is absolutely masterful. When he talks about in order to plan for your, for your future and everything, you don't need a nip and a tuck. You need a plan. But his hands are just crisp and his hands are precise. And you can bet that he has practiced and choreographed and set every single finger in motion exactly the way he wants to do it. And that is a very rehearsed effort on his part. But you see the results because you see the way his hands talk to you. And he's very, very animated. He's very, very crisp and direct with the hands. So gestures, facial expressions, very, very valuable in a presentation. Voice inflection. A lot of speakers or people who get up in front of an audience who don't have a lot of speaking experience, just because of nerves, they go about 90 miles an hour through the entire presentation, and they slam right through and they don't give any breaks, and they just tell you all the information they've got, and then they ask for the call over at the end, say goodbye, thank you, I've had a nice time, and they're gone. And the audience is sitting there halfway through trying to catch their breath. <sighs> Please, just give me a little bit of a break because you're wearing them out. So you need to relax a little bit. You need to use your voice as an instrument. 
And I can show you how this works by the use of eight words. I can use the same eight words, all, I think they're all one syllable words, but I can convey seven different meanings to eight words. And this, the sentence is, I did not say he beat his dog. Just through voice inflection, I can give you seven separate meanings. I did not say he beat his dog. Carl might have said he beat his dog, but I never said that. I did not say he beat his dog. I might have inferred it, but I didn't say it. In other words, I'm denying it. I did not say he beat his dog. That fellow over there, he beats his dog all the time, but I didn't say he did. I did not say he beat his dog. Kicked him around once in a while, but never saw him beat him. I did not say he beat his dog. He had a tendency to work over the neighbor's dog quite often, but never seen him beat his dog. I did not say he beat his dog. He was hard on the cat, but I never saw him beat his dog. So you can see how voice inflection can have a, really set the tone, set the, the meaning of what it is you're trying to say. Eight simple words, seven different meanings, just through voice inflection. Now part of voice inflection too is what we call vocal texturing. There are going to be times when there's going to be a build of, of excitement in the message that you're bringing and you're going to have to pick up the pace a little bit, you're going to have to pick up the volume, you're going to have to bring the audience to you, you're going to have to bring them to the cliff. But then when it's important and you want it to carry weight, you're going to need to slow down. Pace your message. In other words, what you want to do is change the posture of the audience. There's going to be times that you're going to be setting them back in their chair with their ears pinned back with the excitement of what's in your message. And then you're going to need to change their posture and you're going to have to bring them up and have them sitting in the front of the seat leaning forward to try and hear what the next important piece of that message is. Of course, then you get to blast them back again and sit them back in the chair again. But part of what that does is it takes a message and takes the monotone out of it and it creates some excitement, it creates some variety. The other thing is the pitch of your voice too. Again, voice inflection. I can be excited and be high pitched or I can drop my inflection to have my words carry more weight. So the voice is a very important tool in what you are trying to convey with your message. The thing you want to do is you want to utilize all the tools that you have at your disposal because again, we don't want to just deal with the conscious mind of the audience. We want to get into the subconscious mind of the audience because that is where they're making their decisions at. So you have to get into the long-term memory aspects. You have to be able to stir up the memories that people have and the perceptions they have in their own minds so that when you stir those things up, you get them to make a decision based on, again, is it moving me towards pleasure or is it moving me away from pain? And the only way you're going to do that is you have to break through the resistance of the audience. You have to get them to come along with you for a little bit. You have to keep them entertained. You have to keep them stimulated so that then you have the best chance of being successful in what your purpose is, what it is you came to accomplish with the audience. Notes. Notes are fine to a point, okay? Some people will write down every single word in a speech. And then they have a tendency to just drop their head and start reading to you. That's a dangerous thing, especially with a head like mine. Because the glare becomes very, very distracting. If I just drop my head and start reading to you, I guarantee you, you're going to get a little irritated and annoyed over that. But the other thing it does is, if you are relying heavily on notes, and you lose your place, you're in big trouble. You are swimming upstream at that point because if you're giving a presentation and you lose your place, it's difficult enough. Now, if you've got six pages of notes and you lose your place, can you imagine how difficult that's going to be to hunt through all this copy, find out where it is you made the wrong turn and get back on track? It's going to be impossible. And three or four seconds lost in your train of thought is going to seem like three or four minutes to you. And it's going to seem like probably 10 or 15 seconds to the audience. Here is a little tip if you do lose your place. You're giving a presentation. You're in the middle of it. Things are going great. All of a sudden, something happens. Some minor distraction goes on, and all of a sudden, the mind just goes blank. Here's a clue for you. 
You're the only one who knows you lost your place. Nobody else knows at this time. Keep your mouth moving. Keep air going in and out of your mouth and your throat. Keep forming words. Keep talking conversationally. And eventually, bada bing, bada boom, the thought process returns back to you. I was at a speech competition up in, actually it was the same one, it was the district level, when the first year I made it to the semifinal round, and I wasn't too worried about the other speakers because I, w I wasn't too impressed with what they were bringing. I spoke last, so I had the best advantage. I got to listen to everybody else, and you're kind of gauging them, and you're, you're grading them, and well, this one I'm not too worried about, this one had some good points, this one was doing. A guy by the name of Melvin Russell came up. Really nice suit, really well dressed. And Melvin Russell came up and his speech was money, the root of. That was the title of his speech. And the first thing he did was he came on stage with his hand in his pocket. And that didn't impress me very much because that's one thing you don't want to do is have your hand in your pocket when you're talking to somebody. It makes them think they're kind of unimportant as a member of the audience. But he came up and he said money, wampum, moolah, dead presidents. And he pulls a $20 bill out of his pocket and snaps it a couple times. That worried me. I was really concerned at that point because not only did Melvin dress for the part, he was very articulate and clear in his diction, very clear in his word usage, but he also had something called style. And I was concerned. I sat right up in my chair and I, this was the fellow I was taking notice of. But then about two-thirds of the way into his speech, he lost his train of thought. He lost his place. And everything came to a screeching halt. And he stopped for several seconds, he put his hands together, desperation picked up in his face and he looks over here and then he looks over here. And then it finally occurred to him, say something, anything, just keep talking, keep the message going. And I could tell at that point he still hadn't gotten his train of thought because as he was talking, he's looking up. And I know from, this, from working with the subconscious mind that when you start looking up and to the right, you're starting to access the creative processes, creative centers of the mind, and you're starting to make stuff up. <laughs> Not going into the memory centers, but going into the creative side of the mind. And I knew he hadn't found it yet, but then within a few seconds of talking, looking through the mind, searching the files, it came back to him. But in that six, seven, eight seconds, Melvin Russell went from being a contender to being a pretender in that competition and didn't even finish in the final three. There's going to be times when you're giving a presentation, you're going to lose your place. Again, up to that point, it's a mystery to everybody else. Unless you let them know by the way you handle that emergency that you've lost your place and let them in on the gig. So the best thing is keep talking, keep the mouth moving, make sure you keep those things going on it. The last thing you want to do in an effective presentation is you need to have a proper close. If you just run through and drop them off at the end without any word, it's like the cab pulling up in front of the house and, okay, everybody out. It's like, well, it was a nice ride until that violent end. It's like falling off a ladder. It's the sudden stop at the bottom that really makes it an unpleasant experience. You want to summarize what it is you've talked about. It's the old adage of the way a preacher approaches things. is first thing he's going to do is he's going to tell them what I'm going to tell them. And then the body is I'm going to tell them. And then the summary, the close is, I'm going to tell them what I told them. And that's really a good way to follow to get an effective presentation put together. At the end of that presentation, you want to wrap things up. You want to summarize things. You want to go over the points that you've made so that they get one more shot at the message. And then you want to give them the close, the call to action. Now in Toastmasters, as Yuri had mentioned, we meet the first and third Tuesday of the month at 7 o'clock. Our meetings start at 7 o'clock. So if you show up at 7.01, you're still welcome to come in, but you're going to be coming in during the meeting. We have a saying that the meeting that starts on time ends on time, and that's really true. But one thing that we do is we practice these things each and every night that we meet. We have several different parts of the meeting that are used to facilitate the honing of speaking skills. We have a Toastmaster every night who's going to do all the introductions. They're going to be the MC. They're going to keep the pace of the meeting going. They're going to give a little warm-up, going to get us started, get the blood flowing a little bit, and then effectively introduce each and every presenter that we're going to have that night. We do something called commentary. It's good practice to be able to get up and give a commentary because commentaries are usually something that you're very passionate about. 
You have a lot of drive about it. Might be an ax you want to grind. It might be somebody you want to compliment or an organization you want to compliment or something you want to bring and shed some light on. But it's good to have that commentary so you, you have a little more force in what it is. And the commentary is short. Again, you've got to get it done in a short period of time. We have a joke master. A person will get up and, and either give a few jokes or do, do a little educational session on how to effectively present humor. Because humor has to be presented effectively. It has to be set up properly. There has to be the proper pause. There has to be that little unexpected twist in order to make humor an effective delivery. And again, humor is going to be a vital part of an effective communication simply because you're going to give that audience a little break, allow them to breathe a little bit. So it's always good to know how to do a joke properly, how to use humorous stories effectively, how to create those mental pictures and things like that. That's always good practice. We also have a reading master. There are going to be times when you're going to have to give a presentation that may have a lot of technical information in it that cannot be memorized and you're going to have to be concise and precise and accurate and you're going to have to read the information. What we practice there is how to read the information without bringing our notes up right in front of us because again now we've got a little barrier here. It's just like pointing at somebody. You put this up here, all of a sudden I've got a little wall here. I'm going to separate myself from my audience. But how to First of all, know how to write it out or have that information large enough so you can see it and actually read it. But then also how to create some gestures in the talk, be familiar enough with that information so you can create some gestures. And how to occasionally look up and keep that contact with the audience. Because if you go into a, a two or three minute reading and you lose eye contact with the audience, you may have had them along for 20 minutes. Exclude them for two or three minutes of reading, you've lost them. You may not get them back. So it's important if you have information you have to read on there that you're doing it correctly. You're maintaining the eye contact and the gestures and the things that keep the audience connected to you and you connected to your audience. We have an educational session. The educational session is going to be on any number of topics. It might be on how to develop a storyline, might be on how to develop openings, how to effectively close a speech. Anything that has anything to do with public speaking is fair game for the educational session. By far the most Intense and everybody's favorite part of Toastmasters, and Toastmasters in the audience, bear me out on this, is table topics, right? <laughs> table topics is, well, it's almost unfair. What table topics is, somebody will get up and they're going to pose two or three questions to individuals in the audience that A, do not know they're going to be called on, and B, do not know what question they're going to be asked. And it is then their responsibility to stand up and respond with some sense of coherency about the question that they have been presented with. They don't have to be factual. They can make stuff up, but they have to speak. And it's good practice to speak without ahs and ums, you knows, and things like that. And we time people during the presentations. We time on table topics. You have to go one to two minutes in your response. So you can't give a 30 second response and think you did your job. And you don't want to go four or five minutes or else they're going to put you in for the best speaker award possibly if you did a really good job and they're going to chastise you at the end of the meeting for going too long. So everything is timed. We have an ah counter. And once you become aware of ahs, ums, you knows, you'll never be able to listen to another interview with an athlete ever, ever again on television or radio. It'll drive you completely, completely insane. Because it's just verbal fillers is what people do while their mind is trying to come up with something, their mouth just cannot stop moving. <laughs> That's where the you knows, the wells, the ums, the things like that come from. Every night we have two or three speakers, but most importantly, we also have individual evaluators for the speakers. There's an old saying that people go where there's excitement, but they only stay where there's growth. That's why we have people who have been at Toastmasters five, 10, 15, 25, 30 years is because everybody continues to grow in the organization. When that evaluator gets up, they're going to go over some things that speaker's doing well. They're also going to go over some things that that speaker could have improved on. So maybe some things that were distracting. And I even got, one night I, I got kind of hounded because I had some coins in my pocket and every time I put my hand by my side, I jostled the coins in my pocket. I didn't think it was a big deal, but it distracted the guy who gave me the, the evaluation. So who's more important, if it's a big deal to me or if it's distracting somebody in the audience? It's important if it's distracting somebody in my audience. 
because he might not be the only one that is being bothered by that. So you get the feedback, you get the evaluations all the time on what you're going through. The other thing you're going to realize in Toastmasters is everybody there is there to encourage and support everybody else in reaching their goals, regardless of what those goals are. Some people want to become better communicators with their children or their spouse. Some people want to climb the corporate ladder and they want to realize some professional success through speaking. Everybody is there for different reasons. But the great thing about it is everybody is there to support you in what you do. When I spoke at the finals the first time, they, they have a big video production and they shoot from three or four different camera angles and they got a sound booth there with the big boards and everything in there running the levers back and forth. But Bill Stevens, who runs a video production company that films that, when we met the, the Friday before to, to pick out and select speaking position, it's just a card draw is all it is, you don't know who's going to go when, but he says tomorrow you're going to have a unique experience that you will never again duplicate in your life. I don't care if you're a professional speaker for the next 30 years, you'll never duplicate this. Tomorrow you're going to walk out in front of 2,000 people and everyone in that audience is going to be rooting for you. If you give seminars, I guarantee you half the people are not rooting for you. Half the people figure out if I'm getting a day off work, I'd just soon be golfing or fishing. I really don't want to have to be here putting up with you. The other half of the audience figures they know more about what you're talking than you know about it, and they think you're a big waste of their time. It's the same way it is in a small Toastmasters meeting. Everybody that's there is there to help you succeed regardless of what your goals are. I, I've really had a wonderful time. I'm thankful to be able to be your speaker tonight. I've had a wonderful time going through some of the skill sets that are involved in effective communication. I do invite people who have any questions. We have a microphone here. If you can come up, ask your question. If you're too shy to come up in front of the microphone, just spit it out to me and I'll repeat it so we can pick it up on the camera. But if anybody does have any questions, I'd like to close with a, a question and answer if anybody has anything they'd like to Chris, address. I'd like to thank you. Thank you. You're very good, but you were born. <laughs> you were not born like this. I can only presume there must be some things that you have struggled with, that you have overcome. Can you talk a little bit about those experiences? Sure. And you're right. I wasn't born like this. I can remember sitting in speech class. They used to have speech class for kids who didn't pronounce vowels and, and consonants correctly. I had always had a problem with S's, I still do some to this point. I can remember every Tuesday for an hour sitting in speech class with a teacher, me and three other kids. But the biggest problem I have in speaking is I speak very fast a lot of the time. As I explain to people, I speak at about 350 words a minute with gusts up to about 475. <laughs> and a lot of times that can be very distracting to an audience. So there are times when I really have to consciously slow it down keep it real so that I'm not just running slipshod over the top of people's ability to hear what it is that I'm saying. So those are the, the things that I have to keep in mind of. Also, I, I do presenting every day with the work that I do, and I have a, a presentation. It's pretty much a canned presentation, and it goes through a number of different points, and I have a tendency that I've picked up that every time I hit a new point, it begins with now. Talk about this now, the next thing we're going to talk about is this, and get done with that point. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is this, and it's like a now show. So those are things that I have to really keep an eye on and, and be cognizant of so that I, I don't keep repeating those, those same types of errors on it. But good question. So if you prepare a presentation and you have it all mapped out and you know what you want to say to people, but then you get there and you're reading your audience and you find that they are not with you or they're not um, in the same place or maybe agreeing is a better word, um, what do you do in that situation? How do you modify on the fly what you've got all mapped out to give to them? Really good question. I really wish I had an answer. I'm sorry, but no, actually. <laughs> That's a difficult task, and a lot of times it's just a matter of reconnecting with the audience again and, and finding a different way to connect with them. It might be through the use of humor. I, I remember actually very, very vividly, I, I gave presentations in Janesville when I was doing stop smoking seminars. And I was presenting in Janesville on September 11, 2001. 
and I hadn't heard the news. We start setting up at seven in the morning. We start doing sound checks and everything with the sound system. We start setting up registration table. And I could not figure out why it was the audience was just in, they were all sitting there with their mouth open looking like monkeys doing math problems. I couldn't figure out what it was. And they weren't picking up on the humor, the jokes. And a lot of times what you need to do is ask your audience a couple of questions. Because usually the ones that are having the biggest problem with you, if you put it out to questions, they're the first hands that go up. But you need to get some feedback. It also helps, the more experience you have, it gives you a number of different approaches. You have more ammunition, more bullets in the holster, so to speak, so that you can change speeds a little bit. For an inexperienced speaker, it can be a very hard problem to overcome. But a lot of times it's just a matter of stopping the message and then work with connecting again whether it's through stories. One thing, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of speakers. Um, everybody knows who Tony Robbins is, right? Tony Robbins, six foot seven, he's got teeth about this big, just a dominant physical presence in front of an audience, and he has great information. The information is probably 50, 60 years old, but what he's done is he's found a new way to present it. But what I find with Tony Robbins, as good as the information is, after I've heard it, I will within a week forget 60% of it because it's hard to remember all the points. On the other hand, when I listen to Zig Ziglar, I can usually remember about 90% of what his talk is about because every important point that Zig Ziglar brings out in a message, he does through the use of a story. And a lot of times, the way the human mind works, it's hard to remember individual points, but it's easy to remember stories. And once you have the story remembered, if you can recall the story, you can recapture the point. So a lot of times it may be having to incorporate your message into a story so that the audience can follow along. It might be just that the information you're giving is being given at a different level than they're able to receive. So you have to kind of gear it down. Now Ziggler also said he always he, um, puts his, his information together so that it will appeal to people at the fourth grade level. He says that way even the college professors understand what I'm talking about. But a lot of times that's simply what it is, is you have to change the way that you're bringing the message in into a way that the audience can associate with. It's just like we have the problem in education today where there are a lot of students, they're, they're labeled as, as educationally deficient or learning disabled, when actually they work at very high levels of intellect, but they don't associate to the way most teachers present in a classroom. And those successful teachers are the ones who can switch gears, take a different line of, and a different angle of approach and can reach them through a different association. So a lot of times it's not the message, it's just the way that you're presenting it and you have to kind of shift those gears, but you have to reconnect. Speaking of speakers, uh, last week, Rick, we heard a very good speaker in Barack Obama. Do you think he accomplished his objective? And if so, why or why not? Good question, and I think you're right. I think Barack Obama is an exceptional speaker. He's uh, been referred to as a once-in-a-lifetime kind of, of leadership guy, but, you know, I think he accomplished his goal. I think he accomplished what he set out to do. Did he accomplish a victory or a success or a level of success for everybody in the audience, for everyone that he spoke to? Absolutely not. You're never going to. There are going to be some people that, regardless of how you present it, Regardless of how much good information you bring, there's always going to be something that they're not going to accept in your message. And there again comes back to the fact that there are going to be audience members in every group you speak in front of, they're going to be resistive to what you are saying. Therefore, you want to utilize the proper tools so that you can break down those walls of resistance, be able to get in and communicate with them. It's very important to do that. So I, I think it was, it was one of the most masterful speeches I've ever seen. And for a politician to give that speech, to me, was an amazing thing because most politicians will not go into the meat and potatoes of an issue. They'll dance around the edges a lot, but they won't commit themselves to the core of the message because it opens them up to, again, members of the audience that are not going to be happy with them regardless of what they say. But it was a wonderful speech. Um, you spoke of shifting gears earlier, and I noticed as you speak, you change, um, you change pacing a lot in the middle of your speech. You change your inflection. And uh, sometimes you'll, I get the feeling you'll lull us into a nice, easy pace, then you'll jump on something really fast. 
Um, it seems like you are making really sudden changes that are really interesting, I find. I wonder if you could uh, talk about your approach to shifting gears within the speech, how you think of it in your own mind. Do you plan out every minute or so, I'd like to change gears? Um, how do you approach that? And then also, how do you teach people that, not just in a large group setting, but individually? Do you get people, do you listen to their speeches and have them stop and say, this is a place where you could pick up the pace, you could shift gears here, or would, would you rather have speakers delve right into the message and speak right from their heart? I guess there are two different approaches to speaking, and I'm curious what your, uh, what your approach is. Good question, I appreciate the question. I, I look at speaking like riding in an automobile with somebody else doing the driving. If you're driving along, you're at the same pace all the time, and you're on an interstate highway, and you're driving at the same rate of speed, and you're driving through, let's say, Illinois where it's flat and it's really boring. Pretty soon, the person sitting in the passenger seat is doing this, and the people sitting in the back are doing this. On the other hand, if you're driving down the interstate and you got passengers in the car, and you speed up, and then you slow down, and then you quick change a lane, and you do this, how many people in the car are sleeping at that point? <laughs> this many. Nobody's sleeping at that point. That's why I like to change pace, I like to change inflection. And these are all things I learn from being in Toastmasters. I was actually encouraged by Zig Ziglar. I took a workshop down in Dallas, Texas with the Ziglar Corporation, 1992. And his recommendation, he took time to speak one-on-one -on -one with everybody that attended the workshop. His recommendation to me when he talked with me one-on-one, -on -one, what my goals were, what I was trying to, what I was there to accomplish, he said, Rick, when you get back, join a Toastmasters club. Best advice I can give you. And it was great advice. But a lot of times, and do I plan those changes? Sure. I will change the, the flow of, of the information that's going into the making of the speech so that I can change pace, that I can change inflection, that I can mix it up a little bit. And as far as the, the, the instruction part on groups and individual basis, we have a general evaluator that will evaluate the entire meeting at the end of the night. But then every speaker who's giving a specific presentation, uh, they will have an individual evaluator, and we definitely go through those things. Uh, we have Lori Friesen in the office. She's going to be our representative this year in the international uh, speech competition, which is it, hopefully she goes all the way to the World Championship of, of Public Speaking, which is the finals. And last week she won in our club, and she got dissected. You know, we went through everything. There were some passages that were a little long that didn't really relate to other parts on it, so we kind of broke those things down. And through working with the group, you get a number of different viewpoints. And obviously, a speaker has to take everything that they receive with a grain of salt. But if you start hearing the same points being brought up by three, four, five different people in the audience, that's something you really want to pay attention to because there's really something there that's affecting more than one person. But we, we also do it on a group basis. But we will also, every pe person in the group will have a mentor. So if, let's say you're scheduled to, you're kind of a new Toastmaster, you're scheduled to give a presentation in a, in a week or 10 days, and you call your mentor up. This is what my task is, what's the task really all about, and how's the best way to approach it? Or they may say, you know, I've got my speech developed, can I send you a copy of the speech and you know, review it and give me your, your honest input? I have speakers now from all over the, the country and actually all over the world now that will, when they get ready for the finals, they'll start sending out emails and sending their speech text to other speakers who have made it to the finals just to get their input. You know, you've been in front of this group of judges before, uh, how do you think this is going to work or how do you think that's going to work? So, yeah, we do everything from the, the actual analysis and evaluation of the speech itself to the written components of it. Uh, one of the things we worked with with Lori last week was wasn't enough humor in the speech, you know, because you've got to have enough humor. In, in the international speech competition, the rule of thumb is if you don't get a belly laugh out of the audience within 90 seconds, you're toast. So we, we want to make sure that we take the, the vastness of the experience of the group, and we're not called the Club of Champions by accident. We have placed more people in the international finals than any other club in Toastmasters. We, on a regular basis, will we'll put speakers into area division and district competitions. We regularly reach the regional, which is the semifinals, in not only the international speech competition, but also in the humor speech competition as well. We take competition speaking very seriously, but we do it in a way that doesn't intimidate people, encourages them to grow at the pace that they can grow at. Everybody's very supportive, and we're not there to, to, to blow people out of the water. We're there to to really nurture them and, and make sure they get everything out of the experience that they wanted to get and what they came for. So good question. Anybody else? Good question, because it's mechanics. And the question was, how do you set up the room? You know, do you 
pretty much arrange things to your own liking or do you stick with what's there? Do you, how do you handle your notes and that? Normally in any lectern there are shelves underneath where you can have your information there if you're using notes. Tonight I used just an outline. I used one sheet, just had an outline of points on it. But what I wanted to do was have this in front of me so that I make sure I stay on track and we don't waste a lot of time. And really it's, it's the speaker's not only his prerogative, but really his obligation to make sure that the room is set up to enhance the audience's experience. And, and it varies in a lot of different ways. It might be the speaker will say, you know, I, I want a more casual, this is kind of set up a classroom style, I want a more casual setting. I may set chairs up in groups. If I'm going to have some group information, I may want to gather chairs in different areas. And the aisle is too wide. It really makes this thing look like a highway going down here, and I really want to have more of a narrow focus. So you, you really want to make sure that you're setting up the room to enhance the message that you're bringing. The other thing that I do, and, and when the, you get into competition speaking, when they speak for, they choose for the speaking order, and then they do a mic check, because a lot of people aren't used to a lavalier microphone like I'm using tonight. And you can always tell the ones that have never used one before, because when they do the mic check, they go testing one, two, you know, and they think they've got to put their mouth right down by the microphone. But what I do is you're up on a platform, and a lot of times it'll vary greatly in size. Sometimes it's an eight by eight area is all you've got. And what I'll do is when everybody else is doing the mic check, and they usually will give off parts of their speech. I get up and I test one, two, three, and how can you hear me over here, and is it all right to the speakers? How's the sound in the back of the room? I have had people get up and give two minutes of their speech during the microphone check and really, and they always give the best parts of their speech because they don't want to look foolish up there during the mic check. So they'll actually give you their ammunition before they've actually had to do it in competition. But more importantly, they'll walk back and forth on the stage and I'll notice there are some parts of the stage that really squeak when they walk on them. And I'll avoid that area of the stage like the plague. I've also seen competitions where people will walk up during the mic check and I notice that there's spots in the stage where their whole face is in a big shadow. And then I'll watch in amazement as almost every speaker comes right up front and center in the front of that stage and stands with their face there in a the shadow. They weren't paying attention to anything that was going on during that microphone check. So yeah, you wanna, I, the one thing that I do also with competition speaking, you're giving a speech often that you've given a hundred times. And I learned this technique from Garth Brooks, a uh, presentation special that he had. And what I do is when I give that presentation for competition, I'll take a few minutes and I'll sit in the third seat in the front row. And then I'll sit in the 14th row, seventh seat over. And then I'll sit in the 22nd row. And then I'll come up and sit over on this side. I'll sit. And I'll take a few minutes at each spot I sit in. And all I'm focusing on at that point is because I've given the speech 100 times, it's become commonplace for me. But I think that the person who sits in this seat tonight this is the only chance they're ever going to have to hear my presentation. What can I do to make sure that this is going to be a special occasion for the person who sits in this seat tonight? And that always focuses your energy, gets you pumped back up again so that when you get up there, the 101st time you give it is the best time you've ever given that presentation. So there's a lot of things you can do with the room that can make for a better presentation. Excellent question. I'd like to thank everyone once again for coming down. Thank you, Rick, so much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Please remember to join us for the final installment of the series. It's going to be on April 22nd, and we're very lucky and proud to have State Representative Michael Sheridan speaking to us. So I hope to see everyone here, and thanks again for coming down. Thank you.